Hello, and welcome to 2023. Uh, I'm Kirsten Burke, and I am joined, as always, by my partner in cybercrime, Shane Peruse. Um, welcome to our January Tech Talk. Uh, we're excited to be starting a new year here in California. We've got sun, which is something new for us after the last month. So all systems are go for 2023. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> um, we thought that we would start out the year um, reflecting a little bit on last year, but also as we looked forward into 2023, really talking about the key priorities or the key things that we saw um, going on in the market as we go into the year. And so we've identified three. We're calling it our top three list. And um, just really wanted to share with you what we're hearing from our customers, what we're hearing from our partners and our technology vendors, um, in the hopes that it's meaningful and helpful for you. So where we're going to start off is um, really how do we plan for uncertainty? And if nothing, if we've seen nothing in the last five years, right, between a pandemic, uh, economic uncertainty, um, nothing stays the same. And I think uh, as IT organizations, we're hearing more and more how do we plan for uncertainty, right? You you try, you plan for what you know, but how do we plan more for what we don't know? And how do we be um, both more proactive but more responsive? And uh, as Shaheen and I were talking about this, a military term came to mind. And really in the cybersecurity space, a lot of things kind of are similar, right? We have an attacker, we are creating defenses, we are creating response plans, um, simulated attacks, and so really kind of a military philosophy applies in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. And so why don't you share with us kind of our first our first phrase? Yeah, the uh, the, the the thinking around creating plans uh, is that you're trying to plan every possible outcome mm -hmm. and, and address those outcomes and respond to those outcomes. The the challenge is, and this is the this is the construct that comes from the military, is that no plan survives contact with the uh, with the enemy and uh, the reason that's an issue is that the enemy is also making plans mm -hmm. so it's not a one-sided we're not the only one sitting here planning mm -hmm. the adversaries have been planning that's why they have new techniques that's why they have new tactics that's why the miter attack matrix matrix keeps growing that's why there's new malware that's why we've you know we talked about metamorphic malware a couple of uh, uh sessions ago mm -hmm. And all these things are happening because the enemy has determined what our tactics in response are to their attacks. Therefore, they adjust their plans, they make tweaks to their plans, they anticipate our responses, and they create plans that react to those responses. And similarly, we have to work in that, that construct. And uh, the other attribute or, or notion is that a good offense is the best defense mm -hmm. and or vice versa, the best defense is a good mm -hmm. offense. And part of what that really means is that, I mean, if you attack first, obviously you have an advantage. So that that makes all kinds of sense. But the other side of that is that if you are understanding the tactics of your attacker, you can better defend against those. Mm -hmm. And so if you're anticipating what you would do if you were the attacker, then you can make decisions about if I ran into this wall, I would go and make this decision instead. If I ran into this other wall, I would make this decision. And it's very easy when you're the defender to determine what those walls are and how somebody's going to get around those walls because you're implementing those walls. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the the you take those two constructs of mm -hmm. best offense is a good or best defense is a good offense. Also, no plan survives contact with the enemy. If you put those two together. That'll start to give you context around how you should create your plans for uh, incident response, for business continuity, for whatever. Well, and it would seem based on what you're saying, the things that come to my mind, right, are so your plan has to be adaptable or agile, right? And and we've seen this, right? Everybody has to go home on one day. How do we get? How do we? How do we go from twenty percent remote workers to hundred? or you know, there's an economic situation going on out there, how do we continue to do what we need to at a security level at a lower cost or with fewer people? So you gotta be adaptable. Um, it would seem to me that you would need to have a way of inspecting, um, testing or inspecting on an ongoing basis. So if we know the enemy is constantly changing or if we know, you know tools are sometimes working and sometimes not, it would seem that you've gotta have a way you know, almost real time, but on an ongoing basis to say, okay, is what I think working, working? And if not, I need to be alerted quickly rather than 
say for an annual podcast. Um, and then it would seem on your response, um, you have to be able to deploy that response in a lot of different ways. Right. The um, it's it's almost impossible to predetermine your response is the best way to think about that. Um, responses are muscle memory. Um, and again, stealing from law enforcement or military, the way that a, a, a troop plans a raid is that they build a mock-up of the facility they're gonna raid and they will run through mm -hmm. that raid many times until they successfully hit the time window they said they would and the objections or the object of target that mm -hmm. they intended to get. So if they're trying to save someone, they're running through repeated scenario that scenario in different ways until they say, we can accomplish this in this many minutes, this mm -hmm. many seconds, or whatever the answer is. And that same thing translates to the cyber world. We when we talk about incident response plans, when we help customers develop them or our own incident response plans are all triggers for actions you need to take. So when X, this thing triggers and a series of steps might follow that thing that triggers. Mm -hmm. And the series of steps are where you need to be adaptable mm -hmm. because not every time somebody is using the same attack is the steps in the attack mm -hmm. gonna be the same. Mm -hmm. uh, especially today with the metamorphic malware, which is changing the way it behaves. It might look like a single, single attack, uh, a simple attack on the front end, but it's changed the way it behaves throughout the attack cycle. Mm -hmm. And now it's a totally different attack. Mm -hmm. So you have to change your tactics in terms of how you respond with them to mm -hmm. it. Um, so where, the incident response plans fails are most people sit down and say, when we get attacked, Bob is going to do this. Joe is going to do this. Steve is going to do the other thing. And it's about the responses we're going to do to the attack. And we categorize ransomware as an attack. Ransomware is not one attack. There is so many different types of ransomware. Most attacks today are starting from email. 93% of all attacks start from email. Uh, and 80% of those uh, malware that end up on an endpoint have a requirement to connect to a command and control so that they can become ransomware. So when I say 80% of attack, you got to imagine there's tens of thousands of different ways to accomplish what I just said, and we need to be able to identify and block them. There's whole nation states and hacker communities out mm -hmm. there that are attempting to create ways to bypass the security controls we built. So uh, tediously and tried to implement uh, solutions that block, make these walls effectively. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, you can't plan the response to something that is an unknown. But what you can do is you can look at your known unknowns versus your unknown unknowns. I know that the hacker is going to come in and attempt to take access of a system, attempt to take the credentials of an admin and use those to move laterally across my network. And there's there's limited sets of things they can do to do those things. There's there The technology isn't as complex as it sounds when you break it down into its moving parts. First step is compromise the system. That's unfortunately the easiest thing because our weakest security tool in the market is our users. Mm -hmm. um, you just had a great conversation with family member trying to help them through not calling Microsoft because something popped on their screen saying mm -hmm. call Microsoft. Mm -hmm. um, our end users are our biggest weakness in a security control. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter how much we train them, no matter how much security awareness we give them, they're still going to make a mistake. It's it's a fact. Mm -hmm. So that's why the 93% of all attacks originate mm -hmm. in email because the attackers also know this. So you know the compromise of the system at some point is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Somebody will click something bad and they will download something malicious on their on their environment. The next thing you know is that that thing, in order for it to spread, needs to go get malicious code or needs to connect to a command and control center to be able to do the next thing. So you start looking for those things. So it's it and it builds like that. Mm -hmm. So you can't respond against ransomware, but you know the basic movements mm -hmm. of a ransomware. Mm -hmm. It's first going to land, then it's going to try to evolve, then it's going to try to spread. Mm -hmm but it also needs credentials. So it's also getting credentials. Mm -hmm. So all of these things are happening in parallel. And usually the adversary is sitting in our network for 200 days on average in the industry. Mm -hmm. That's six months of time they have to do these things. Mm -hmm. And the faster we find them, the faster we can react. Mm -hmm. But this response plan is not about 
I need to, as soon as I see ransomware on a machine, I need to do X. It's when I see things that look to appear malicious in nature, they should trigger these activities. Mm -hmm. If you go to, if you're implementing an incident response plan, it's too late. Something bad has already happened. You're probably encrypted at some place. The ransomware has taken hold and the hacker has triggered whatever attack they have. That is way too late to respond. And oftentimes you're going to end up with systems encrypted. Hopefully the controls you've put in place will address that and stop the, the impact from a large scale perspective. Mm -hmm. But those things are all facts. Mm -hmm. Everybody will get some level of system encryption in a ransomware attack. So that's a lot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and and you can understand why, as you're out there talking to people, as as our team is out there talking to people, this is top of mind, right? Yes. Because um, there are so many moving parts, and there are so many, um, you know, different paths to go down. Um, so that that certainly makes sense. Yeah. Um. Well, we'll move on to the next one, um, which is oh, Be before we. I mean, this this applies to everything, but before we move on to the next one. It is a lot, and part of why it's top of mind uh, is that I feel that a lot of manufacturers, vendors, and even competitors uh, in the industry have done a disservice to security because they try to simplify this. It, it's not simple, and when we try to simplify something, we're trying to you know barney it down so it's easy to understand. And the problem with that is we have a false sense of security that just implementing mm -hmm. this one thing this vendor sold mm -hmm. me is going to solve the problem mm -hmm. because I've got fill in the name mm -hmm. that fill in the name promised me that it's going to be good. And they mm -hmm. gave me a million dollar ransomware warranty that if I get ransomware, they're going to pay me money. There's a lot of tiny, tiny print on that warranty. So mm -hmm. uh, buyer beware. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it does this disservice to the community to say that this tool is that silver bullet. Mm -hmm. It is that pill that is going to make you lose a hundred pounds overnight. Mm -hmm. Those things don't exist. Mm -hmm. Security is all about defense and depth. Again, another military construct. Um, mm -hmm. It is all about layers yeah. of defense and there is no single tool in your stack that will solve the problem. It yeah. takes, it takes many, an average, uh, one another industry metric, an average uh, properly prepared security organization is running about 30 to 40 mm -hmm. tools in their stack. Yeah. That's a lot of consoles to manage. So give that a, a, a thought when you're thinking mm -hmm. about, I've got fill in the blank right. and it's solving my problem. And what uh, all of what I dumped on, on this community the last few minutes is a lot of moving parts. It is a lot but it's because it's a complicated right. set of things that have to happen and work well together to right. help defend against it. Right. We don't have one of the world's largest militaries in the United States because it's easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. Well, and, and that's a good segue um, because the, the second thing that we wanted to talk about um, are really um, how the insurance industry is adapting to this complexity to the sophistication sophistication of our attackers, to the realization that for businesses, it's not if, it's when. And so you're now not insuring for a small percentage of occurrences, you're insuring for when it happens to everybody. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as any smart, smart business does, right? If they continue doing things the way they are, they will go out of business. Yep. So, um, let's talk a little bit about how the insurance, cyber insurance industry is responding because we, um, we've had a lot of people come to us and say, wait a minute, either I was insured, but now, you know, I'm seeing to renew, I have to up my security game, or if I'm new to cyber insurance for me to even be insurable, there are things I have to do. And it's very different than even a year or two ago. Yeah, we're seeing um, from our prospect and customer base two to 400% increases in insurance premiums for cyber insurance. Why? That's the first question we ought to be asking ourselves. And what's happened is the going into COVID, there's three things that happened. The first one is 
ransomware spike to 600% of what it was before March of 20. Mm -hmm. Overnight, it blew up and it's been growing at a steady scale, not 600%, um, uh, but it has been growing at a steady scale. Um, it is now a crazy amount larger. It's something I think like a thousand percent compared to where we were in March of 2020. Mm -hmm. But it's the reality is that factor means that the hackers got wise that our people are going to be working from home and they don't have firewalls protecting them anymore. So now a click on the link will allow a malware to get the DNS connection it needs because their home firewall probably isn't going to protect them. Mm -hmm. So there's a much better chance. So it was the splatter approach. Mm -hmm. It was the shotgun approach. Let's let's splatter as much as we can on the wall. Something's bound to stick. Mm -hmm. So that was the second factor as everybody went home. The third factor is that um, the uh, everybody decided, okay, there's much bigger risk and they bought cyber insurance, mm -hmm. even if they didn't have it. So those three things happen. Fast forward to 21 and 22. Uh, one out of every two companies was hacked. Look left, look right. One of those people was hacked. Maybe it was you. So fact number one. Fact number two, 75%, three out of four systems that are targeted are successful. Fact number three, of those three out of four systems that were compromised, one of them is encrypted. So you're looking at a 25% attack success of encrypted environment and if that wasn't enough, 80% of the people who were compromised are compromised again. Mm -hmm. They're hacked again. Mm -hmm. So those factors all came into bear. So insurance companies are finding themselves paying out mm -hmm. and it's no longer on the insurance side's benefit. Mm -hmm. If you think of insurance, like I hate to say this, look at it like you're going to a casino. The house is always stacked to win. Insurance companies have always been stacked to win. That's why they're a business. That's why they're in the business. They haven't been, mm -hmm. not for cyber insurance. Mm -hmm. So what happened? They decided we need to go back as an industry and figure out how to deal with this because this is real. This is no longer a joke. Um, it's not It's not child's play anymore. And the outcome of that was the you know, 10, 20 question questionnaire that they sent you to get you signed up for cyber insurance is now 300 questions. So it's much more complex and it requires a lot more things. They're not accepting I have antivirus. They want to know that you have an EDR solution. They're not accepting that you have a firewall. They want to know that you have a next-gen firewall. And, mm -hmm. and let's be clear, they don't always know what those things mean, but the manufacturers have whispered in their ears and given them brands to put in the categories. Mm -hmm. So fill in the blank has done a good job of saying, I'm this, but these companies are not. Mm -hmm. And so you're now fighting against vendor selection in terms of your insurance because your traditional antivirus solution that you've used, which now says they're EDR, really isn't EDR, like we talked about in a previous talk. And now you have to think about, okay, I got to change that technology. Mm -hmm. Then there's, um, we've historically built out this model. It's It's like this planning approach, right? My regulation, whether it's industry or governmental or our own embedded, says that I have to have a SIM. So it's a checkbox. I got a SIM. It's collecting logs. Not one person looks at it, but I got a SIM mm -hmm. and I, I meet the checkbox and I do log collection and aggregation. I've got endpoint security. I've got fill in the blank on that one. They're now saying, prove to us that you're looking at it. Prove, prove to us that you are doing something mm -hmm. with it and prove to us that you're correlating information from all these different systems. Mm -hmm. Um, and there not only have the premiums gone up, but to Kirsten's point, because of the 300 question questionnaire, there are companies that they have said, we're no longer going to insure you unless you do these things. Mm -hmm. You're not eligible for cyber insurance. There are industries which in, entire providers have said, we're not touching that industry mm -hmm. because they have been hit more than anybody else and the risk is too high for us. Right. The house will not be stacked if we insure them. Yeah. So so the if you think about all of those factors that are coming in, and if you think about the planning conversation we had, they kind of are falling in line with each other, which says... You know, we're not we're not talking about two of the strategies from a um, or priorities that you should be thinking about for 2023 is what is my plan and approach when my premiums increase for cyber insurance and what am, how am I going to modify 
my plans to not be focused on response, but mm -hmm. rather than actions that we take and phone calls that we make mm -hmm. and things that we do mm -hmm. and that everybody's trained and we're doing those things when, when the incident happens. Because yeah. we've been saying for decades, it's not if something is going to happen, it's when. And the metrics I just threw at you, if you look left and right and there's two of your peers that have been hit or one of your peers that has been hit, how long can you expect before it's you that's standing in that hot seat? Yeah. And uh, everybody has had attacks. It's do you have all of the tools that tell you what holes to block, what uh, what happens if an attack gets through, how you res can respond, and the efficacy of the response when right. something gets through. Those are, and that's why real security stacks are thirty or forty technologies uh, in in concert. Not, not in isolation. Yeah. Well, and I think, I think in the past, people have maybe heard that number and call it 10 or 20 or 30 or whatever you call it. Um, I think a lot of organizations in the past, well, that doesn't apply to me. I don't need that. Right. It, it does. You know, I'm not, I don't, I'm not that sophisticated. I don't do X. I don't do Y. But I think what we're seeing in both of these, you know, number one and number two, and sticking with the poker analogy, right. A more mature security posture is now table stakes to, to do business, business to, 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 to do whatever you're doing. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of organizations don't go into business thinking that or planning that, or you're putting your business plan together, right? Have I put the line items in there for the staff, the technology, the, all of that. And so I think this, this shift just continues to happen that puts more of a burden on organizations to develop this as a competency. Yep. And there are a lot of organizations saying, wow, this is a hamster wheel that, you know, is, is necessary, but boy, can it detract from the business? And I think that takes us to number three. Um, before we get to number three, though, there's, sure. there's another factor that is in this cyber change, because the cyber industry is also saying that a big part of this risk is coming from your supply chain. Yes. So, um, supplier risk assessments mm -hmm. is something that they're enforcing, which means now you have to have not just the tools, but you have to have a security program that is going and inspecting that the people in your supply mm -hmm. chain also are doing all these things mm -hmm. that you're supposed to do. So not only does your security team have to think about internal, what mm -hmm. are the best technologies and you know how much is this gonna cost us and what's the impact from a budget perspective, but now you have to spend the cycles to go and talk to your air conditioning manufacturer right. or your, uh, you know, anybody who's in your supply chain of technology, whether it's supporting your facilities that has access to your facilities, to technologies that you use to deliver your service and how they've secured their technology. You now have to go and inspect them to make sure they've done these things. Right. So, and, and it's not yet where cyber insurance is going to say, if you don't have a uh, supplier risk plan or assessment uh, in place, we're not going to insure you. But I I would place money on next year. We're yeah. going to be talking about that's the new reg new thing that cyber insurance is enforced. Right. And if you're on the other side of that, if you're not the the entity that needs to check their suppliers, if you are one of those suppliers, suppliers, how are you, you know, how do you all of a gas? sudden you're having to meet this threshold, yeah. you know, that, that, you know, may not be relevant to your business, but for you to do business with the people that you want to, you have to hit that. And you also have to have cyber insurance to protect your, right. your, uh, customers, right. which in turn means you have all these 300 questions right. to answer, right. which in turn means you've got a security program to build, right. which in turn means you have to go inspect your suppliers. Right. And it's this domino chain Triple of effect. Down. Yeah. So, so this is this, this change in insurance um, approach to addressing this market is pretty significant. It's uh, the premium change is not the biggest part of it mm -hmm. because yes, your premiums will go up. But in order to even get to pay those premiums, your security spend is going to go up. Right, right. And so the the third um, topic is, you know, at what point does it make sense um, for an organization or where does it make sense for, for an organization to get help? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and it's kind of like all, you know, other areas that the businesses have at some point said, you know, important, have to do it not core to our business and and managed managed security um 
managed security providers are really, really starting to move into that realm, right? The, the challenge there is there are a lot of different people saying that they play in this space and you, again, buyer beware. Right. But, you know, at some point you had mentioned earlier that, um, you know, I think we've been conditioned as technology buyers, right? I'm buying tool X and I am I have an annual contract or I have a three-year contract. And we know now that these tools don't stay, uh, they don't have the same efficacy year one as they do year three. And so when you're buying your tool, um, when you're committing to something that long, right? For, you know, and you're buying 10 or 20 or 30 in that stack, um, it's, it's almost like your battery efficacy of your phone, right? After a while, it starts really dropping, but I still have a year left. And, and, and so you think about the workload, the tool buying, the tool efficacy, the staffing, the monitoring. Um, and I, I, I know we don't have too much more time on this one, so we won't go too deep into number three, but but let's just talk at a real high level, where and how, if you're an organization, does it make sense? And, and maybe if you're not sure it makes sense, you know, what is the economic pace for th even thinking about it? Like, let's, let's just explore it. Yep. Let's talk about that. Yeah, the, um, the biggest challenge in, in this last one is uh, as technologists, we like to build things. And I and and I'm talking as individuals, not as data and or or as Shaheen. We like to build things because mm -hmm. we're we like playing with gadgets. We like playing with tools. We like shiny new things. We like we like learning and we like growing. Um, and the problem is, we also have a day job, which is differentiating our company from the competitors. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking all of us in the IT information security space. Our job is to make sure that we're delivering quality services and user experience to our customer base and at the same time staying ahead of the Joneses and com completely differentiating what we do from everybody else so we can stand out so our customers will continue mm -hmm. to stay our customers. We have to earn your business every day. And whether I'm in the insurance industry or I'm in manufacturing or whatever, my job as a technologist should be to figure out how to differentiate the company. Problem is many times we're dragged into the muck with things like we just described, which is our insurance premiums went up and you have to do these 30 things. So mm -hmm. all of those projects that would differentiate us, the financial systems, the automation, the whatever, the manufacturing floor systems, those get put on hold because we're focused on closing this gap for this audit or to finish the cyber insurance uh, review or you name it, fill in the blank for this. Um, the impact of that is we don't have time to be experts in anything. Mm -hmm. We have to move quickly. We have to rely on the expertise of our um, uh, partners who are selling us technology. We have to rely on the fact that they've done the due diligence and know which tools are the best, and they're not driven by which has the best margins or revenue for them. Um, and it's it's a it's a tough thing, and that's why people end up building relationships with someone they feel has never screwed them. Excuse the French. Um, but ultimately, to come back to the question, in order to really get an understanding of your economic roadmap, you really should be doing evaluations of technology. You really should be understanding the timeline of tools and their efficacy. Um, for example, there's no possibility, and it hasn't happened in my career, if somebody has a different opinion, there's no possibility that one manufacturer can stay the best in class for any more than five years. I have not seen it happen. Um, there's always somebody which will leapfrog ahead of them mm -hmm. and stay technology-wise. Uh, they'll do an enhancement. Mm -hmm. And if we tie it back to that military approach we talked about, why does the military spend so much darn money on weapons, on planes, on radar, on defenses? Why do we keep advancing military tech? Because the enemy does too. Mm -hmm. And so if, the, if you pick endpoint security tool, fill in the blank, that tool is probably not as effective as it was five years ago, and it is probably not best in class anymore. And, and that changes. That there Somebody rises to the top, and they can't stay at the top for more than five years, in my experience. And this is 30 years of experience in security. And 
The reason for that is everybody is trying to do something different and they don't have the technical debt that particular manufacturer has. They built something that was great five years ago, but all of that underlying code underneath the surface is still dragging them down doing the same thing. And they're trying to figure out how to plug in new ways mm -hmm. to address new attacks and new techniques. Whereas all of a sudden the shiny new company pops up three years into their life cycle and has addressed the current, what is the current landscape of security threats that is designed for whatever is the new thing. Um, you know, there may be some uh, 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 completely uh, uh, crypto based or uh, a big current type approach to attacks in the future that aren't there today. I mean, where those types of things, those uh, activities that are happening in the world today from decentralization can have a major impact in terms of how attacks can happen. But we're, we think about it as security. Sure. But if it's security, there's probably a good way to take advantage of it for other things as well. And, and so the next evolution of attackers and tools that they attack with will not be addressed by the technical debt that's in the tools we use today. So that constant evolution and, and replacement and refresh of technology, that life cycle of systems is, is the thing that takes most organizations down. And that's when the hackers have the best success at the end of that life cycle, mm -hmm. because those tools are long in the tooth. They don't do what you were supposed to do. Um, I had a customer who got compromised because they were using ASAs that had not been updated. And the hacker came in through the ASAs from the edge and got on their network and spread. And, uh, Cisco, best in class security company. They they are one of the people we think about when we think security. But if you're not staying current, if you're not using the new technologies, if you're not refreshing, it doesn't matter that you have a brand name. Um, and so a managed security provider, if you're working with the right one, right? When you think of technical debt, when you think of refreshes, all of that starts being done in the background, right? And I so- do. If you're working with the right one, so instead of buying tool A and you're stuck with it for three years or whatever, right, you have got someone on your behalf who is constantly evaluating that stack, who is working something in, who is phasing something out, and in theory is keeping you at the, at the leading edge of where the attacker is versus that back end where you have more gaps. Yeah. The uh, uh, the way to really separate um, the ideally comment I made, how to, how to parse that is if you've got uh, a managed security provider, a managed service provider that is selling you technology, reselling technology, and then managing it, they're not doing that refresh for you. Yeah. Same issue. Yeah. They, they are selling you technology based on whatever they believe is the best at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, that may change over, over time, but now you are tied into evaluating if that technology is in fact the right one or not. Mm -hmm. um, that's where, you know, it's nice to have a company that has technologies that address all of the control segments you're trying to uh, address. But again, why are we aware of if it's, if it's a single manufacturer, refer to my previous conversation, which is they can't stay at the top of their game. Right. It's hard to be the best in every class. So, you know, um, our, an approach we take, uh, which isn't completely unique, but it's close to unique, is that we continuously improve our technology stack. We're always looking and always doing shootouts to figure out, is this tool still the most effective tool at solving this problem? Mm -hmm. And if it's not, we replace that across our entire ecosystem at no cost to our customers, at no cost to uh, no TCO required, no change in pricing. Mm -hmm. It's just embedded in the way we approach uh, bringing solid security mm -hmm. services to market. Mm -hmm. Well, let's end this January segment, um, <clears throat> you know, faced with all of this and really starting kind of halfway through last year, um, you know, you brilliantly led an initiative to put together an economic planning roadmap that our clients could use or, or, or not, you don't have to be a client to use it, but, um, and we would like going into 2023, we would like to offer this to our listeners. Um, and so maybe quickly as we wrap, maybe you could just describe 
a little bit of the elements of it, um, how it might benefit them, no strings attached. Right. But as you look to plan for uh, challenge one, challenge and challenge two, you know, we would like to offer you this as a benefit to really help you think about where you are um, and and how you are going to plan your improvements. Yeah. Um, the uh, As you can imagine, there's a lot that goes into that process of figuring out when and how to swap out technologies when you're doing this continuous improvement approach. So taking that decades of experience and putting it into a tool, we created this economic roadmap, which with a simple uh, uh, input sheet will collect what tools you're using in your technology stack for security, um, what the what the counts are on those tools, and what your spend is if you're willing to share that. And in a, in a complementary, um, meaning that we offer it to you in a complimentary way, we will take that data and we'll process it through the, the analysis that we do and come back with a recommendation and a roadmap and a timeline that tells you based on when the licenses expire, how many you bought, what you're spending, here's options for you to consider at these times. And um, that that is an ideal time for a tool refresh. That is an ideal time for looking at a different way of approaching it. And that roadmap is laid out for you for your three-year strategic plan for security. To take you, the whole intent is to take you from whatever security maturity level you are to a security maturity level of five. Sure. And in, and in some of those cases, right, for those organizations that are thinking about when and where might I want to pull myself out of this and bring a managed security partner in, um, part of those options are you can continue to do what you're doing or you know, if you look at a managed security um, uh, provider, how and where that might impact both your spend and um, and your licensing and all of that. So, so we invite you to contact us and and participate in this. We we'd love to do it for you. And um, with that, we will say thank you and goodbye, and we will see you in February.